European travel by Americans is way up. So there's, uh, the country's uh, on the move. <laughs> That's for yeah, sure. Exactly. Everyone's eager to get out. So we'll, we have a lot of uh, topics to get to today. So let's jump right into it. Um, so first up, companies like Apple, Amazon, Meta have reported their earnings this week. What have we learned from earnings season so far? Well, I did a story on this today for, uh, for Trader Talk. Uh, it's up on the website. Uh, and if I had to put it in one sense, I would say the earnings apocalypse has not materialized. So remember, we had this period in May and June where the stock market just fell apart. Um, and it fell apart because there was a fear that the Federal Reserve was going to hike interest rates so aggressively that they were going to cause a big recession somewhere out in the future, the, somewhere towards the end of of, uh, uh, of the second half of or early 2023, nobody knew, but everyone was convinced the Fed was going to basically create this very serious recession. This has happened before, so it's not a fantasy. Uh, and so the the stock market started pricing in um, much lower stock prices. Um, but what they were really doing was anticipating that earnings would start coming down. Because one thing that we know this is very well studied historically, is that earnings go down in a recession. And it depends on what kind of recession. They're not the same. They're all different. But in a garden variety, modest, mild recession, earnings would typically decline 10 to 20 percent peak to trough. Um, and this is usually the S&P 500. So you're dealing with a whole bunch of companies all aggregated together. But um, that's very typical. And in really bad recessions like we had in 2008, 2009, it, we were down 50 percent on earnings. Um, so think about it. That's what the stock market. What do you get when you buy stocks? You're buying a dividend, number one, and you're buying an anticipation of a future stream of earnings uh, that are going to be profitable. And somehow the company will share that with, with them either by dividends or distributions or buybacks or something like that. So uh, there's a very good historical reference here where when you go into recessions, earnings usually drop. So everyone was anticipating this was going to happen. And a funny thing happened along the way. Um, earnings for some sectors definitely came down. So, for example, some really big stocks had earnings cuts like Amazon did, for example. Uh, they've now two quarters of negative, uh, uh, essentially, uh, uh, declines here. That's very serious. Uh, other companies like Meta, Facebook, also had declines. Um, so there were some companies that really saw noticeable declines um, in their earnings. Um, but by and large, the overall S&P 500 did not. And even today, we're anticipating that earnings will be up in 2022 about 8% for the year. And they're anticipating about 8% earnings growth for 2023. That's a long way out. <laughs> Nobody really knows what is going on in 2023. But the numbers for 2022 have held up pretty well. And part of the reason, even though some companies have had noticeable declines, is it's been offset by gains elsewhere. So, for example, the oil companies are just gushing profits. You see ExxonMobil reported today. They're, they're just printing money. Their, their earnings are up about 100 percent year over year, 2022 compared to 2021. 100%. And the revenues are up about 70%. This is remarkable given a company as big as Exxon. You know, usually you talk about that you move revenues 5%. Their revenues are up 70%. So these numbers are huge. So the, the, the Exxon Mobil and Conoco and Chevron, all those guys, they're pushing up the estimates for the S&P 500 because the amount of money they're making, the profits, the dollar volume of the profits is so high, it's pushing up the overall estimates for the S&P 500. So at the same time, while some companies are, have their estimates lowered, others are doing really well. This argues for why you would own S&P 500, for example, because uh, it's an aggregate of, of everything. So it's a really screwy year, to put it simply. Um, some companies are seeing their earnings estimates drop, some are not. But the key thing is this, what I call the earnings apocalypse, where everything just falls apart, isn't happening. And that's a, a major thing for overall for the market. So if you own the broad market, you know, that's a big, big relief. So what it is sort of saying is it's highly unlikely we're going to go into some really serious recession. 
at least based on the historical evidence for corporate earnings. Now, that doesn't mean we couldn't have some kind of uh, economic downturn. In fact, that's probably happening already. But um, at least so far, um, the earnings apocalypse, uh, you know, hasn't happened. The one that we usually find when we have these kinds of situations with a serious um, recession. Well, we'll definitely keep an eye out on the rest of earnings season. Hope things go smoothly. Um, one company, though, in particular, Bob, that I wanted to focus in on is Walmart. Um, Walmart cut its profit outlook for the year. You know, what did we learn from Walmart's earnings and specifically about consumer spending habits? Well, Walmart is under pressure from higher inflation. So uh, think about what happens here. Food inflation has been very noticeable, depending on what kind of food you're eating, but there's definitely some very serious food inflation going on. So uh, the Walmart consumer is up there, and they're on set budgets, of course, uh, and all of a sudden, food costs go up, pick a number, 10% or something like that. So if you have a household budget that's devoted, you know, sudden 40% to food, pick a number, and all of a sudden you're doing higher, 45% or 50% to food, and you're on a strict budget, that's less money that you have to spend on something else. You have to spend more on basic items like food. So what Walmart discovered uh, and announced is people are spending more on food, largely because of the inflation costs, but because of that, they have less money to spend on discretionary items. What's that? Well, it's like a lawn chair or something like that. Um, it's a, you know other, some other consumer item. Uh, and what happens for Walmart is Food is a very low uh, margin item. They make less profit on food than selling you lawn chairs, for example. Uh, so those other discretionary items, like a lawn chair, uh, you are more profitable. So the two things happened with Walmart. First, the inventory shifted. All of a sudden, you might have more lawn chairs because people are buying them less, or more clothes, for example, because people are buying them less and because they're spending more money on food. So they had an inventory problem and, and they have to have an inventory adjustment. This is why you're going to see some apparel people have these markdowns in the summer. Good time if you want to buy clothes cheaper right now. Um, and so that was a problem for them, an inventory adjustment. The second was a profit issue because they're not making as much money selling food as they are selling clothes or lawn chairs, for example. So you see the two problems here. Um, inventory problem and a profit problem. Now, this is um, you know interesting to look at how this will affect other companies uh, as well. Uh, Amazon is very different than you might say. Oh, Amazon's a retailer, Walmart's a retailer, but nah, they're very different. Amazon has a different customer base. Uh, it's you know one hundred twenty dollars a year, whatever their yearly fee is, is a lot. So it tends to appeal to a middle upper class consumer, whereas Walmart is middle lower uh, consumer. Uh, and also Amazon has um, Amazon Web Services, which is a web, uh, which is a cloud service business. That's a very significant part of their business. Uh, that's completely different than the business of them, Amazon as a retail person. So Amazon is a different dynamic than, uh, than, than Walmart. Um, a better thing to look at would be something like uh, Stanley Black and De Decker, which sells tools. They have reported uh, very disappointing earnings because two things. Number one, the cost, the physical cost of building, say, a drill, that's what they make, um, has gone up. So they're raising prices, but they, the, the, the amount of money they can raise for the drill doesn't completely cover all the costs, the added costs. So they're having a margin, this is called a margin compression, number one. And number two, Stanley Black & Decker was really big in the uh, do-it-yourself. So remember during COVID, everybody fixed their house up. Well, now COVID is, well, it's not over at all, but uh, people are going out more. So there's more of an emphasis on going out and less on fixing up your home. So a company like Stanley Black & Decker have two problems, number one, uh, Cost problem and number two, they have a shift in consumer demand. Less emphasis on fixing up your home, more emphasis on going to the shore or going out to dinner or something like that. So you see how the, these inflation uh, issues are affecting people in in, in very very different uh, ways here. 
So Bob, it was a big week. Um, not only did we have a busy week for earnings, but we also got another rate hike from the Fed. Um, what does the Fed's 75 basis point rate hike mean for investors? And you know, where do you think the central bank is going from here? Well, think of what they're trying to do. The, the Federal Reserve was created in 1913 really to do th two things, to smooth out the economic crises that occurred throughout the 19th century. Uh, but their two mandates were, number one, uh, job growth, and number two, to fight inflation. Um, so that's the two things they're supposed to be working on. They're not supposed to cure all the ills of the world. That's really what they're supposed to do. So the problem with this is um, they haven't had to really fight inflation in a long time. It hasn't been a, a really big issue since about the early 1980s. Um, and there's a number of reasons why inflation has been lower. The global economy, the growth of the global economy has made everything more efficient. So supply chains are more efficient. It's easier to uh, uh, concentrate uh, construction and development if you have uh, fewer factories, for example. Uh, and so the global supply chain has really become very efficient. Now, the whole thing got disrupted in COVID. And there's a lot of political stuff going on, for example, with China that's getting disrupted. So we're in the process. It's not deglobalization, but some supply chains are changing. So, for example, the United States has decided, I think correctly, that certain things like pharmaceutical manufacturing and semiconductor manufacturing are very important uh, national security issues. And we need to keep the supply chains a little tighter and closer to home. I think that's a very logical conclusion. Um, and I certainly would support that as well. So that implies some disruption to the supply chains. If you have to, if you're building a semiconductor plant in Taiwan and you have to reproduce a semiconductor plant in wherever, Ohio or Texas or Canada, um, that may be good for national security, but it makes things less efficient. It may be more costly, those chips may be. Same thing with anything else. Even if you're making clothes, you might say, I want to, make t-shirts in the United States, but t-shirts can probably be made cheaper in China. So your $3 t-shirt here might be $10 if you made it in the United States. Now, maybe we want to make those t-shirts here in the United States, but you're going to pay more for them for sure. So um, think about what happens here, what the Fed, the tools the Fed has. Their job is to fight inflation and, you know, create jobs. Well, jobs doing pretty darn good. A record, more people there, there are more jobs out there than there are people. So now they look at inflation. Inflation's kind of out of control for the first time in, since 1970s, late 70s. So they are very focused on that. They don't have many instruments to stop inflation. Basically, what they can do is they can raise interest rates, short-term interest rates only, and they can kind of try to, you know, somehow influence the money supply. Uh, so... Um, the, the the game here is for Powell to aggressively raise interest rates. Well, the, the way the hope here is by raising interest rates, you slow economic activity and that will cause a reduction in demand and that will slow down inflation. Well, it's a, I think that's a not incorrect way to look at things. Um, the problem is that it's a very blunt instrument to do, to use, to try to control inflation. We don't have a better one, really, but this is hard. And the Federal Reserve has historically tended to raise interest rates too much and created a recession, which is not desirable either. So you want Goldilocks. You want to be able, uh, what, what you should be rooting for here is a modest slowdown in the economy. That's what you want. And that reduces some demand. So you want Goldilocks. You want you want to root for what they call the soft landing, where the Federal Reserve raises interest rates enough, the inflation comes back down, but the economy doesn't fall apart. You just slow the economy a little without re inducing some serious, you know, economic problem. Um, that's the soft landing. So the Fed doesn't know what it's going to take to slow down inflation. They don't. Nobody does. So. They're going to keep hiking rates until they see some evidence that things are slowing down. They're going to hike rates again in September, probably. 
uh, probably, we'll probably get another 100 basis points hike. So we'll get probably get 50, in, 50 basis points. That's a half a point in September. Maybe another 25 or 50 in November, maybe 25 in December, something like that. We don't know. They could hike 75 again in September. We just don't know. And they don't know. They're all data dependent. We got another month and a half to the next Fed meeting, and they're going to watch and see what the CPI number is. It'll be out next week, the jobs number. And that's what they're going to watch. So it's all a game of waiting. And you can see the reaction in the stock market right now. The stock market seems to be betting that any economic downturn, which is likely happening, will, will be mild and not severe. Now, that could be wrong. There are people who think it is wrong, but it's not the consensus thinking right now that we're somehow going to fall apart uh, and go into some serious economic downturn. So, you you know, if you're, if you're rooting for the stock market to stay up and you're bull, then you want Powell to succeed. You want him to be able to slow the economy without throwing it into a, a serious recession. Thanks, Bob. So million dollar question. We had another GDP uh, report this week um, for Q2. Are we in a recession? What are you hearing, Bob? Well, this word recession causes no end of problems because for years people used to use this shortcut uh, that a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. But actually that is not the definition. Um, and Powell was asked about this repeatedly. The people who make a decision on this is the NBER, the National Bureau of Economic uh, Research. And their definition, hold on, I actually pulled it up um, because I thought you'd ask me this. And they define a recession, a re here it is, a recession involves a significant decline in economic activity that is spread across the economy and lasts more than a few months, okay? I'll read that again. This is the National Bureau of Economic Research. They def they're the ones who decide. A recession involves a significant decline in economic activity that is spread across the economy and lasts more than a few months. Jay Powell was asked, are we in a recession? He said, he said the same thing. I'm quoting from Jay Powell's press conference. A recession is a broad-based decline across many industries that is sustained for more than a couple of months, and it just doesn't seem like that now. Now, the reason Powell said, gave the exact definition of the NBER and then said it doesn't sound like that is because one of the key considerations for, the, for a recession is the, the level of job growth and job activities. And it's so strong now that it doesn't jive with prior recessions. So it's there isn't an exact series of metrics that have to be met to hit the recession. It's more like an art than a science, but it you would do good not to get you know word wrapped up in this recession word. In fact, you'd be good not to get wrapped up in the semantics of all this. What we know is inflation is definitely impacting people, um, some more than others, the Walmart consumer, for example. Um, and uh, that in itself is reason to address the issue. So don't get caught up whether we're in inflation, we're in recession or not. Just figure out what you should be figuring out is how we can address the inflation issue. That's important. And I see some progress here. So for example, you know, oil has come down significantly. It's still too high. Uh, that's a major indicator of inflation. That is an inflation gauge, in fact. Now, oil is really complicated because of this Russia-Ukraine thing. So it's not a simple issue. Uh, but there is some signs that commodity prices are moderating. That's a That would be a very important trend to continue. And we saw that in July. So there is some hope here. If you look at the GDP, you're asking about a recession. What we saw here is a very notable shift. So during COVID, people start spending lots of stuff, money on goods, stuff for the home. And now what they're doing is, and you saw this in the data very clearly, they're shifting to services. They're going out more, they're traveling more, they're doing more things. So services spending was up, good spending was down. And that makes a lot of sense. I started off by, this, by saying, you know, I've been traveling around, I've been at the Jersey Shore, and I, I mean, they're, people are just out doing a lot of things. So um, that's what you want to look at right now, that shift from goods 
to services. Now, in a real economic downturn, everything kind of goes south. The services go south, people travel less. So maybe, heaven knows, we'll be here in September and there'll be another swoon down. There's a lot of people who are predicting an August, September swoon because we're going to get some crummy economic data. Uh, the doomsayers are going to come out and say, aha, you see, this means we're all going to hell in a handbasket. And I wouldn't be surprised if we had another swoon down. I don't know if we'll go down you know, to where we were uh, in the middle of June, we were at 3,600, um, and we're at 4,100 in the S and P's. So, you know, that would be, you know, another 15% down, but it's possible. Um, again, the problem is we don't know the, how, how much the economy is going to slow down. So if you're in the camp that thinks if it slows down, it's going to be fairly mild then you're probably very comfortable here in terms of the stock market. If you think there's going to be some serious recession, then you know we'll go back down towards those June lows and maybe even surpass it. A lot of people who are pessimistic have estimates of 3,200 on the S&P 500. Well, you know, that would be a new low. Uh, so again, where are you on this debate? Where are you on the earnings slowdown? Or, or uh, where are you on the recession debate? And that's will determine your attitude about the stock market. So, Bob, just to kind of bring this all back to where the stock market stands now. I mean, we've talked about inflation. You mentioned the war in Ukraine. What sectors of the market are performing the best? Well, um, this this month, for example, technology is back in a big way. Now, why would technology be back? Well, because the bulls. If you believe in the mild recession story, you want to buy growth stocks because they've been pretty beaten up. I mean, most of them, if you look at the top five, top seven, uh, seven of the 11 top stocks in the S&P 500 are tech stocks, if you include Tesla as a tech stock. They've getting killed. Th those seven stocks are down 31% on average year to date. And that's not even peak to trough. I'm just taking year to date. That's a pretty big decline. Apple's the only one that isn't down seriously. It's only down like 14% year to date. But some of these other big names down really big. You know, NVIDIA was down 40%. NVIDIA is like an enormous semiconductor stock. I mean, think about that. This is a, do you really think the bulls will say to me, and I think they're right, do you really think that down 40% in NVIDIA isn't enough? That, we're, that you really think we're going to enter some kind of nuclear winter? With technology stocks, you think people are going to use less technology stocks if there's a serious downturn? I don't think so. And I think they're right. Semiconductors use is only going up under any circumstances. It went up during COVID because they needed technology more. This setup I have here, this laptop that's you know staring at me, we, we all of a sudden became Zoom users, all of us, three years ago, two and a half years ago. Uh, and there's technology that's amazing today, that it's enabled work from home. This could be more of the technology that enables this kind of uh, remote work, not less. More technology in our lives, not less technology under any circumstances. Uh, so they are perfectly reasonable. These are the bulls in uh, saying, well, you know, growth is where you, you want to be. And that's traditionally technology. So as people have come to try to convince themselves that there isn't going to be some massive recession and, and not and earnings aren't going to completely fall apart. They're coming down a little bit, but they're not falling apart. Well, you would want to own tech stocks. Now, not all tech stocks, for example, in a higher interest rate environment, stocks that don't make any money at all. And there's a lot of tech stocks that don't, a lot of Kathy Wood stuff. They're not as desirable. You want what is called quality. What does quality mean? Quality means Companies have very strong balance sheets, not too much debt uh, to equity, uh, and they profitable. And profits are uh, going up, not down. So what do you call quality tech? And those are those big names that you, you know, Microsoft and Apple and all of those names. So, you know, it's a tough situation to try to figure this out. Remember, this is all this is all people's opinions. And the stock market is trying to figure out generally what's going on about six months down the road past that it isn't very good at all um, because we we just don't know what the future looks like 
because the future is so complicated that it's ultimately unknowable. Uh, I know that sounds a little metaphysical, but <laughs> trust me, 32 years of watching the stock market here at CNBC, the one thing I'm quite convinced is most people have no idea what the future looks like. Maybe a few months out, you can, you can formulate an interesting opinion, but I'd be very humble. I have been but very humble about my ability to predict you know, the future, and you should be uh, too. This is why you want to own broad-based parts of the stock market rather than be a stock picker, uh, which I've talked about repeatedly. Uh, but that may be a story for another time, Katie. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks, Bob. Um, thanks again to everyone for sending in your questions. Hard to believe it's the end of July. Um, I'm not sure if you have any more travels yeah. this summer, Bob, but. Um, yeah, I'll do a few things. Uh, just this is the last day of the month. The S&P is up about 8% for the month. And uh, just to reiterate why we're up because the earnings picture is a little brighter than it was a month ago. It, we're up because more people are believing that whatever economic downturn we might have won't be as severe as people were afraid of two or three months ago. Um, commodity prices are down. That is giving some people inflation will get start to get under control. So that's the big story, inflation under control. Interest rates are down. The 10-year Treasury yield was 3% a month ago. Now it's 2.7. I know some people think that this is signaling a recession. Listen. Forget about that. Generally, the stock market likes lower interest rates, not higher interest rates. Okay, so that's a that's a good sign. And finally, volatility. People are less anxious. Look at the VIX. The VIX is a measure of short-term anxiety for the stock market. Uh, it's 23. Um, it, it's the lowest since April, uh, and that's pretty good. So, what do I see? Earnings outlook is more stable. Um, less anxiety about uh, a severe recession, uh, commodity prices trending down, interest rates stable to trending uh, down. I'm, I'm talking about treasuries, um, 10 years, the long, the intermediate term. Uh, and finally, um, uh, volatility, that's measured by the VIX, also lower. That's a pretty good reason the, all of that explains why the S&P 500 is up 8% this, this month. Yeah, well, there's definitely a lot to watch here. And we'll check in with you again in a couple of weeks, Bob, as usual. Yeah. Good questions, everybody. Yeah. Always good questions from everybody. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, so much. And we'll talk soon. Okay. Take care, gang.